My name is Alan Stojanovic. Uh, this is David Eau Claire. We work at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, this is actually a sequel to the talk from last year, Logs and Tactical Defense. Did anybody do their homework? Well, a few. That's awesome. That's better than expected. Uh, so I'm going to quickly do a couple of bits and pieces uh, as we get into the new stuff. But first, uh, rec or the recap. Um, so our environment is huge. It's very, very big. We have six uh, B-class worth of public IP addresses. A lot of them go directly to the desktops. We've got uh, now a slash 32 IPv6 public address space. Um, that is an internet's worth of slash 64s. Uh, we have over 600 departments. We have over 450,000 users in our identity management. And we are effectively a city unto ourselves. We have every service that every city has, except we don't actually have our own official fire department. But we do have a fire, um, a fire prevention team. So our motivators uh, if, in trying to actually find some security and protection on this network is around the fact that we have a network that is mostly open, required to be so. Uh, we have, all, all of our departments are, are mostly autonomous. Uh, they have the ability and they have different goals and different capabilities uh, that they go through. Uh, we have a lot of intellectual property. I mean, we are a research institution by, by the very definition of the word. And we don't have a big security budget but from everything I hear, nobody really does. And we have that extra wrinkle called academic freedom. Now, a quick note on academic freedom, because I'm finding that the more people I talk to that aren't in higher ed, they don't quite seem to understand it. Academic freedom doesn't exactly mean they get to do anything they want. What it means is they can propose to do anything they want, but they still gotta go through a committee to get approval. So the idea is they can't do things that would obviously harm individuals or groups, either physically or financially or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's a, a, an, int uh, an intriguing and interesting point, an extra wrinkle to all of our stuff. Um, we have, I like, as I like to say, we have every make, we have every model, we have every vintage, and we have every skill level across the entire university, and we have multiples of them to the point where some of these people, they could be running the same thing, and it's ancient, and they don't even know each other. Now, uh, the recap of what we talked about last uh, last time, just to make, uh, just to bring everybody up to page. Uh, uh, bring everybody to the same page. So we came up with uh, six original what we called recipes, very fast things to try to figure out what, an, what the intent is of network traffic on our, on our network, specifically internet traffic inbound. We had uh, an idea of, uh, around something called the, that uh, we call the trial by firewall. So it's a very simple concept. If you have a, let's pretend that you're entirely a window shop, and uh, there's no reason for you to ever have SSH listening on the outside world. Let's pretend. If somebody touches port 22 on your firewall and is denied, that could go to intent. And if it does, then why not deny them all access? So rather, th uh, now the second one is uh, that we dealt with was known as Dr. Bad Touch. Same idea, except now actually putting a Honey Ports program out there. So you put an unadvertised IP address, you wait to see if somebody touches it, and it goes again to intent. Are they scanning the network? Should you allow them access to the stuff that you allow if they've already shown intent to do something mm, questionable? Uh, the blatant 404 was uh, logs coming in on your web servers when people are hitting up a whole bunch of web pages that don't exist. The big example there was when they go through PHP MyAdmin and he's checking every version that you got to try to figure out whether you've got a vulnerable version. Right there, you've got an opportunity to take an action because that's pretty blatant for intent, right? Uh, the impossible multi-auth, so you find yourself in a situation where you got uh, users ac around the world or across larger uh, pieces. If somebody logs in from, uh, from China and from Toronto at the same time, it's worth looking at. Uh, the questionable single source was another one uh, where it's similar except the uh, kind of from the other direction when you've got multiple users logging in from one place uh, and it's very quick and very fast and more importantly when you see that oh, single IP address doing the fail, 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 fail success, maybe that's something you might want to look at as well. And then finally, the, the last one that we came up with back then was uh, the fake phishing attack. So when you see a fish come in, one of the things that, uh, that we've been playing with is that we actually fill in the phishing forms with fake credentials, see where they come back from, and see who else they come back as, and potentially action anything that we see from there, from blocking the original attacker all the way through to resetting any passwords that were actually successful from that source. So 
those six recipes led us to as some combination of actions. The original actions that we had at the time was basically based around the idea that bad intentions deserve to be denied. If you can, in, if you can figure out what the intent is of somebody coming into a network, maybe you can deal with it sooner. The sooner you can deal with it, the better off, theoretically, you should be. Um, the idea, attempt to block the attacker, not just the attack. I mean, sometimes you'll be successful, sometimes you won't, but that was our ultimate goal. Of course, whitelist where appropriate. Uh, you don't want to necessarily block your vulnerability scanner, especially if you're automating all this. And you don't have to worry as much about false positives. You're going to have false positives, so what you got to do is make certain that you can deal with them quickly um, so that they don't become a major problem. Uh, sadly, they're a part of life because, well, you know, hackers, they try to hide all their tracks anyway. And of course, investigate and test everything. Aggregating IP address sources was a big one. This was very, very useful. So the ability to say, well, I've got a network over here that's a uh, complete ASN that's n done nothing but bad things and is completely um, attack an attack vector and has never had a valid login, well, think about blocking the entire IP space. Um, investigating the repeated compromises, either user or machine. So you get the same machine compromised multiple times or you get the same user clicking the same phishing multiple times. It's a re-education opportunity. And uh, hot spots of compromise. Uh, so being able to track where people are getting compromised, for us it seemed to be airports, hospitals. Uh, there was a couple of more that escaped me at the moment, but you get the general idea. So keeping my eye out those, an eye on those people logging in from those locations to make certain that they're not compromised on the fly. It gets you kind of a little bit in front of the problem. And then of course, the research and sharing. Uh, we are a research institution, so we have the ability to share a little bit more than maybe you do, but uh, the ability to be able to just research out these IP addresses that you see coming in. What are they? Where are they? What's the behavior? What's the signature set look like? Look them up, find out what else is going on. Then we had the original reaction set. What do you do with it? We have the, the obvious options, quarantine or block. Block, if you're gonna block, block permanent. If you're gonna quarantine, pick a nice uh, appropriate period of time and you know, work your way from there. You can do it at a uh, sub network layer, so like whatever your, where your critical infrastructure is, or you can do it for the entire organization or any combination thereof. You can also potentially do redirection to safer places. Uh, honeypots is great for that, so if you identify particular types of traffic that are bad, you can redirect them to the honeypot to find out what they're really after. Uh, whitelists still important. Here is uh, one of the things that we discovered was the opportunity to whitelist certain client machines, like your boss's machine. So when somebody calls your boss complaining about the fact that you've blocked websites, he's looking at that website going, well, it works for me. Uh, the all 404, so I was playing with some patchy scripts uh, that allowed me to take a particular source IP address. If that IP address came back, I could make an entire website disappear. Every page looked like a 404. Uh, so suddenly, like tools do really weird things when suddenly all they've got is an Apache container, and yet there's still just enough logs going so that you can see, you can determine some very, very basic stuff. I mean, normally you could do this uh, under other circumstances as well, but here you can almost automate it. Is it an automated tool or is it done manually? Is it some combination thereof, and how are they modifying their attacks, especially when it looks like there's no website at all anymore. Uh, be prepared to release your quarantine on your block quickly. That was a very, very important thing. And of course, log everything you do as well as what they do. Uh, because you can actually start running reports and all that kind of stuff and it gives you the statistics you need to be able to push up through management and find out yet even more interesting stuff. The new stuff is more about generation of these, uh, these recipes and we're gonna get into that next. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we still had, so we had some failures around a lot of these recipes. And this is kind of new. This is what we've been doing and dealing with for the, the past year. The biggest one that was popping up a lot was the GOIP location detection failure. So we found ourselves in a situation where, especially around suspicious login activity, because we have users worldwide, we have researchers that travel all the time, uh, uh, that uh, GOIP information was getting less and less accurate. Now, I talked about last year the idea that a particular GOIP database, they will actually introduce errors on purpose to find out if somebody's stealing their GOIP database because they want to be able to charge for it. But what we found on top of that was an IPv4 churn was causing these GOIP databases to actually 
get even farther out of sync. So for instance, with the lack of IPv4 space, and people have started selling, buying and selling more and more of this, these networks. So with the one that uh, popped up that was blatantly obvious for us was that we noticed the tech-savvy IP addresses started showing up as it from Indonesia. And it, as far as we can gather, it looks like TechSavvy took over an IPv space from Indonesia, and it was just taking the, uh, the, the GOIP providers a little longer to catch up. Now, the reason that we actually caught that, thanks to TechSavvy, was that the reverse lookups still said TechSavvy. So, but that's a, a local ISP, so we know them well. We caught that pretty quick. We could deal with it appropriately. But imagine if that was in a completely different country, from one ISP to another that you have no idea about. So now you've actually got to watch out for your own GOIP space, uh, or how much of you rely upon these GOIP numbers. And then there's the, the proxies and the Tor. The proxies specifically around people trying to get around geofencing, especially because you, know, you want the US Netflix, Netflix right? Um, and, and all that layer of stuff. Now, one of the things that we've been dealing with to try to figure out whether we can actually get around this is we've been playing with the idea of de-anonymizing uh, at least web logins. So if we had the browser tell us where you really are, not only who you are, but where you are, then maybe we can use that as a more accurate prediction or description of what's going on. However, we're running into a little bit of the politics side there, and we're still trying to explore what this means. Does, will this be viewed as too much surveillance? Will our user base rebel against it? So on and so forth. Another limit we ran into is the device limit. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there is a top end to the number of firewall rules that you can actually have. So if you're automatically blocking, if you're putting in firewall rule denies, it does weird things when it reaches the top. A lot of them do. Uh, so firewall rules, the number of firewall rule objects, some number of objects can be associated with a firewall rule. Number of quarantines. So like if you've got the IPS or the UTM style firewalls uh, that are taking a quarantine list, there is a top end that it's capable of. Uh, number of IP table denies rules if you're dealing with things that host based. This one was interesting because there's no I couldn't find a, uh, an actual hard limit, or at least I couldn't reach it. What I was reaching was a practical limit where when I wanted to process what was already there, the machine bogged right down because it locks the table and then nothing else was getting added to it while that table is locked. So there's a practical limit, there's a theoretical limit, and you gotta watch out for both of them. You could reach them if you're doing this on an individual IP basis. Device capabilities failures, as usual. So the fail open versus fail closed. Uh, I, this, you know this, and yet the one that happens is the one you didn't build for, right? So you're hoping, for, you, you put in a system hoping for a fail open, it fails closed, or vice versa. It happens often enough, uh, and, and it does it under, under weird circumstances because you're reaching the edges of its spec. It's not even about, you know, uh, about reaching a practice or a, a clear limit that they've outlined in their documentation. It's some other limit somewhere else that they didn't even consider. Uh, a leaky rule set. You'll find yourself in a situation where you're putting in these rules and they're not they're not activating fast enough, or under certain load circumstances they're not being honored, or any of that kind of stuff. So we've hit those limits as well. Uh, there's some operational limitations, like some devices when you actually change the config on the device, it requires an entire config reload, and during that time. Is it fail open or is it fail closed? Well, we've had situations with a little bit of both. And then there's also, of course, all the usual problems, the man memory storage bandwidth, all that a layer of stuff, causing wonderful stuff to just fall right over. Um, false positives. So we have the false positives. Um, which is, uh, in a, one particular example that we've come across is as we're tra uh, tracking suspicious account activity, if a user logs in to, uh, let's say RDPs into their work machine and then RDPs from there into a production server, depending on the circumstances, sometimes it looks like two different logins from two different countries. So this is a technical problem. This is something that we recognize and we're, trying, we're dealing with it. Uh, and uh, it is a actual false positive. But the other one that we come across is when the users or the people that were reporting this kind of stuff, when they're telling us it's a false positive. And the big one is, oh yeah, that login from, from local was my assistant using my password to read my email while I'm in Paris. It's, I'm sorry, it's a false positive. Well, actually, no, it's not, especially since here's our policy that says you're not allowed to share your password and go get yourself a delegated mailbox. Uh, that's an organizational problem, but it is a opportunity for, uh, for re-education. Uh, so being able to sit down with them and say, this is why it's not a false positive. Hey, guys. 
Um, so we'd like to interrupt this to talk about something a little bit different here. So um, we've all been through this in one way or another, in the five stages of InfoSec. Um, but how much free credit monitoring do we really need? There's a lot of painful lessons here. And maybe if we improve things, we can actually learn from this without going through the painful part and just get to the acceptance stage. We can learn from this. We can do better. Because we are constantly being pen tested, free of charge, the pen test army. Um, the only problem is they don't give us reports. Uh, we're constantly <laughs> under attack. And um, they have all levels of skill. And uh, they, they do sleep, but they're in various time zones. So um, from our perspective, 24-7, under attack. Um, but they do cleverly hide the reports in our logs. So if we data mine our own logs and log all the things, um, we can actually get the reports. Uh, so um, we can skip those painful steps and, and go right to acceptance. So back to more logs and tactical defense. Um, I'd like to talk about um, what we've been working on, uh, our visibility project. Um, the goal is to monitor all the things. We are monitoring um, systems and network traffic, including NetFlow, metadata, and in some circumstances, PCAPs, uh, and definitely system logs. Um, so one of the beautiful things about this is uh, not everybody logs to us. Um, so by monitoring the network traffic, we can, we can actually get logs, like uh, HTTP request logs and stuff like that even if they're not giving it to us. We can mine out of our own traffic. Um, like a visibility architecture, it doesn't need to be hard. It can be pretty simple. It can be as simple as a multi-port tap in your uh, internet connection, uh, feeding a stack of analysis boxes. But maybe your architecture isn't this simple. I know ours isn't. It can be uh, accommodating though. I mean, uh, we have two different gateways, uh, kilometers apart, and uh, two different uh, internet service providers. Uh, so things like asymmetric routing happen. So uh, traffic might go out one path, might come back another. Uh, so if you're, if you're only tapping any of those given links, you might not have the full conversation. Really, it needs to be all reassembled. So there's a type of device out there called a network packet broker. And basically, what it does is it aggregates all the feeds, it can filter them, and it can load balance the outputs. So the other thing is, you can scale up your analysis. If, if you have boxes filling over at 10 gigs, add a few more boxes, no problem. Um, so really, though, if you're monitoring all the things, you're going to have a huge amount of traffic, a huge amount of logs. Um, really, what you need is anomaly detection. You need to pick the interesting bits out from all those logs and you need to do it in an automated fashion. Um, so you can pick up on things like protocol anomalies. Um, so SSH, um, it is encrypted, yes, but before it goes encrypted, there's a handshake, and the client exchanges a client version identifier, and the server exchanges a server identifier. Um, what you can see is um, if, you, if a specific client identifier is being more aggressive than it should be. Um, that, is, it, that is a thing you can identify it by. Um, the other thing is RDP. Uh, again, it's encrypted, but uh, in the handshake, there is, there's quite a bit of details that go back and forth, including things like screen resolution. Uh, we were seeing tons of, of just impossibly low screen resolution uh, coming through, like 10 by 17, which, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a realistic screen resolution. But these are, these are protocol anomalies you can key on and uh, you know, feed your anomaly detection based on that. Um, also the usual, you know, timing irregularities. If things are happening faster than a user could possibly do, then um, you know, that, that's a good anomaly as well. Um, even simple things like case irregularities. So if a user always logs in, lowercase username, but suddenly you're seeing, maybe from a different country even, um, capital or all caps or mixed caps. I mean, these, these are interesting things that you can key on. Um, so once you're sure, I mean, obviously, uh, you need a certain degree of confidence. You're not going to uh, block based on a minor thing. But um, once you're sure, you block the host. Or if you're not quite sure, but you, you, you think they're up to something sketchy, you can redirect them to Honeypot. Um, just be careful not to block You know the Googles, the Bings, Yandex, Baidu, the usual. Um, 
I'd just like to note here, I'll get back to this in a, in a second, but automation isn't fire and forget. You do need to kind of monitor and maintain uh, because attackers are intelligent and work around obstacles. So any, any defense you put in their path, they will try to work around. Um, so as part of the anomaly detection, um, there are attack tools, right? So I mean, you can, if you can classify specific attack tools, that's a very good anomaly detection. Um, so you can, you can build a set of fingerprints. Um, some tools announce their presence, like NCRAC or THC IPv6 or like Medusa. Um, a lot of them, just they just say, hi, I'm NCRAC. Um, other tools, they have a characteristic pattern, like Nmap. Um, and sometimes these patterns, they, um, they shift by attack stage. So you might see, you might see an attack tool uh, enumerating hosts. You might see it enumerating pages on, say, like a web server. You might say it uh, probing for weaknesses in those pages. And you might even see it, I mean, hopefully you cut them off before this point, but you might even see them um, enumerating your database or exfiltrating your data. So um, also there's, there's common attack patterns like SQL injection. You can develop kind of generic detection. Um, and, but sometimes what you can do is based on those generic detections, you can, you can actually develop custom signatures. So um, for instance, if you see a SQL injection attack, you can build um, a unknown tool signature based on that, right? So uh, it's, it's, even if you don't know what tool it is, it's still useful because you know definitely it's an attack, right? Yeah, even if it's listed as in, in your, um, Signatures, even though it's listed as unknown attack tool 23, as Alan said. Um, you don't know what tool it is, but you know it's an attack, right? As long as it's a strong signature. Um, and run the tools. So um, basically, if you can run tools against yourself, collect those logs, collect those fingerprints, um, then you, you, you can develop a pretty good set of fingerprints and uh, of, of known attack tools, right? So. Once you detect an attack, I mean, block them as usual. Um, but go back and review their actions. What exactly did they do? What exactly did they touch? And, and the responses. So if your server's throwing back 404s, maybe they didn't really get anywhere. If they're throwing back internal server error or, uh, or 200, like HTTP OK, um, then maybe they got a little further than you'd like. But now's a good time to test or hopefully retest the attack to target. Determine, are they actually vulnerable to what they're being probed for? Um, so use your tool of choice, um, something you trust, but also maybe in a sandbox, because some of the hacker tools can be a little sketchy. Um, maybe it would be useful if you know what tool it is to run that against yourself as well, just, just to validate what your findings are. And uh, it's actually really, really good if you're logging all things keep an appropriate event history. For you, that might be a year's worth of logs, it might be a quarter's worth of logs, maybe a month, whatever. Um, you guys decide that for yourselves. Uh, what's great, though, is once you've developed a new signature, once you've developed a new indicator compromise, review that new data, or sorry, review that new signature against the old data. So you can, you can discover, oh, well, maybe we were actually attacked with this before. Um, an example of this is uh, the Angler uh, command and control details that were recently uh, posted by Talos Security. Um, they, they published quite a bit of details. They published uh, command and control IPs, command and control domains. So if you can go back through your data, uh, maybe you only have NetFlow. You can still review your data against the command and control IPs. That's, that's a pretty good hit. I mean, if you, if you have hits on that, it's a fairly, fairly good indicator. But if you're actually logging more data, like metadata, uh, for requests and all that, um, you can actually see hits against command and control domains, which is a better indicator. If you have full PCAPs, however, you're doing great because um, you can then actually go back and review exactly what happened. So if they hit the, the exploit page, maybe that's bad. But if they didn't deploy the payload because maybe the exploits failed, um, you at least know there's no there's no more uncertainty. You can identify definitely what happened, whether whether um, they got exploited or not. So, if you're doing this, you will have so much data. Um, really, you need automated analysis. There's no way you can keep up with this manually. So, what we've come up with is we monitor our metadata flow in real time, and um, we deal with about 
currently about half a billion events a day. Um, and dealing with it in real time isn't that bad. I mean, uh, you guys can do it, no problem. Um, so we, we detect anomalies on the fly uh, based on this metadata. Uh, we use something called a leaky bucket mechanism. I mean, it's, if you haven't heard of it, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. Um, events contribute score to the leaky bucket. Uh, weak indicators uh, contribute a little bit of score. Strong indicators contribute more score. But the score kind of decays over time. So um, if they are contributing enough events that with enough score to the to the leaky bucket, um, it will overflow the bucket and trigger your trigger your action. So in our in our case, we are using this uh, to do automated blocking, um, and we are we are tracking the IP blocking history as well. So if we've blocked these guys before, we'll actually block them faster. So we'll have a score multiplier. Um, one thing to be careful of though is avoiding false positive loops. If you do fl uh, flag something as a false positive, um, it might, if you are letting the score grow faster and faster based on IP blocking history, you might block them more and more. So it might kind of snowball. So we, we cap the IP blocking history score contribution at like 2x multiplier or something like that. But I mean, whatever. You guys, whatever you get to decide for your traffic, that's fine. Um, one thing we have noticed is uh, attackers know they, they know when your staff's not there. They, um, they wait. I mean, they, they fish all week and then they play all weekend, right? They know when you've gone off on holiday or whatever. Um, so having an automated system that never takes a break, that never sleeps, that never gets bored of watching logs, um, it's great because it can keep up with the attackers in real time. So I had mentioned earlier, uh, it's not fire and forget. You do need to take care of and maintain your automated systems. So as you're monitoring events, um, you will notice things that need a little bit more investigation. So um, as part of that investigation, if you notice that maybe, maybe you're missing rules that you should have, or maybe um, you could have picked up on something earlier had you noticed, you know, that's the chance to go back and integrate those changes into your monitoring system. And as you kind of cycle through that again and again, your systems will improve over time. I'm short. <laughs> um, one of the last points just here, uh, for those of you that have come, like I've talked to a few of you that say, where do I start? Monitor, okay? Because you start by trash, just trying to learn what you're looking at and then work your way from there. Uh, anyway, uh, one of the things I wanted to cover off a little bit was how you can actually take all this stuff. So we're talking about some really low-end stuff. You're buried in the wires, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and in the meantime, you've got some management that's actually trying to put together policy sets or find the supports uh, to be able to get to the point of being a mat security mature organization and whatnot. And a lot of the stuff that you've done here, especially if you're in front of them, uh, can actually feed into that information. Uh, the the big and obvious one that pops up quite often is asset management, at least for us. I mean, we are so large that being able to actually even have an asset list is insane. We, we are the definition of BYOD. We were BYOD before there was a term BYOD. So, uh, so finding ourselves in a situation where we can't actually track assets and on top of that, don't own the assets anyway, is an extremely difficult task. When you're actually monitoring the level uh, at the level that we are, then you have an opportunity to be able to actually have another set of triggers that's simply feeding an asset management list of some sort. Uh, you can actually have that feedback loop. And then on top of that, one of the things you can do is you can actually start tracking virtual assets as well. So for instance, if you find yourself in a situation where you've got that, that web server that's actually hosting 15 different websites, each with its own owner, you can actually track one of the, each one of those separately with the owner and report on them appropriately. You can see that traffic if you're actually filtering it properly. You can alert when a new asset shows up, like that pony plug that somebody just tr tried to plug into your production network, or you can you know find those unfiltered and unmanaged assets and deal with them slightly separately. Is it in the DHCP range? Is it you know any of those kinds of things? You can report on dormant assets. How many do you have? Oh, look, this box hasn't actually seen any traffic in NetFlow for an extremely long time. Is it down or is it somebody just doesn't care about it anymore? And now you could take all of that and you can cross-reference it with vulnerability management. So finding a new asset, determining 
just some level of, is this my asset or somebody else's? And if it is my asset, then you find that you can actually automatically do a vulnerability scan of it. You can actually feed that into your vulnerability management system. It says, this is new to me. Go scan this. Let's find out what it is, what it's doing, and whether it's actually vulnerable to anything. So you can do kind of a just-in-time vulnerability management here, too. You can you also, on top of that, with the previous setup, you can have uh, passive vulnerability databases in front of this, too. So you're actually monitoring network traffic, trying to determine whether something is vulnerable at that level and tie that all into your vulnerability management as well. Uh, you can report unreachable assets. Uh, so finding yourself in a situation where a new asset pops up and for some reason that vulnerability scanner that you tried so hard to install can't reach it, is it a configuration problem or do you have another admin over there that has decided that uh, you're not good enough for them and they don't want their assets scanned at all? Uh, this is especially good for IPv6 because as v6 starts coming up, I mean, the numbers are just so huge that being able to track all this is going to be really, really difficult. Threat intelligence. So this is kind of where I've been playing for the past year quite a bit. I've been doing a lot of research on this side, and one of the things that's come up again and again is, yes, there are all these threat intelligence feeds out there, and having one, two, or three of them is actually probably pretty good. But the funniest thing is... Uh, as, uh, uh, as I've learned uh, through other people's research, is that uh, if you had all of them, if you had every threat intelligence feed out there, private and public, you still wouldn't have every attack. Like, there is very, very little overlap. So the one that's actually popped up from there, the logical conclusion to me as a techie in the, in the trenches is the only threat intelligence feed that's actually useful to me is the one I build myself, for myself, with my own info. Now, that being said, still grabbing the outside feeds because it's a faster way to get context around the information that you're seeing so that you can actually take that threat intelligence that you've now built for yourself and enrich it with what you see across the other threat intelligence feeds. Like you see an IP address coming in and you want to find out, you can go over to arbor.net and get the botnet information if you're subscribed or go to uh, you know, Simon. They're, they're, you know, they're local here and they've got some really good information and aggregation as well. <laughs> um, you hope that it'll give you some context around it anyway. Uh, and of course, incident response. So when something's happened, you all, I'm sure, have gotten the questions. Mon management coming at you, what happened? When did it happen? Who did it? What did they do? What did they get out? All of that stuff. Everything in here can feed into that. Imagine if you can actually generate that report in hours instead of days. Wouldn't that be awesome? I'm not there yet either, but we're trying. <laughs> all right. And then... You know, this, but this, of course, does not actually solve the classic attribution problem. You're still not necessarily going to know exactly who it is, but maybe where it came from can get you some, something close. Now, in the larger context, as, let's say, uh, if you're in a more mature model uh, of an organization, you're going to have some sort of GRC model, some sort of governance, risk, and compliance uh, a mapping that you're trying to aim for. And I've purposefully chosen this complex one because they can get really complex, they can be really simple or anything in between. But you can play almost any box in here. You can support the, you, the creation or use or even the implementation of anything in here. So like if you find yourself in a situation where you're bored, nobody, right? <laughs> then you can actually pick one of these boxes and say, I can actually support that policy in implementation by doing X, Y, and Z and by spitting out these reports on an automated basis, so on and so forth what we're trying to do next. So, as I mentioned a couple of times already, IPv6 is gonna be a big issue for us. We have a slash 32, uh, and trying to figure out what we're gonna do with that, I'm not entirely clear. The biggest issue with v6 is that default install has something called privacy extensions. Privacy extensions means that theoretically, every connection outbound from a machine can be from a new IP. Think about that for a moment there. So the smallest network that they expect you to actually deploy is a slash 64. And then from there, you're, there's so many IP addresses that any machine can actually randomly generate a new IP address and use that for X period of time that is undefined. And then, and now think about things like trying to actually report back which user was downloading the latest episode of Walking Dead to, C11, to, to match C11 compliance. I don't know yet. I don't know what that's going to look like yet. Now, from a, it's also not scannable. 
either internally or externally is just too big. So one of the things that we've been thinking about and is the idea that that Dr. Bad Touch recipe right from the very beginning. So maybe instead of actually having uh, an unadvertised IP, maybe I'll advertise this one a little bit. So I'll set up uh, a Honey Ports program listening to a particular IPv6 space with no other IP addresses and give it a DNS entry. Just to see, just to see whether anybody's actually touching it. Because I have a feeling that one of the most obvious ways right now to recon v6 is just to actually try to do zone transfer through your DNS. Most likely way, anyway. Uh, the latest uh, THC IPv6 tools, the latest rounds, not the previous ones, has built-in SIGs, so you could use that. So some of the techniques that they use to discover v6 space, you should be able to detect at least internally. This is our IPv6 space. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> software defined networking. Uh, so we've got some efforts underway to, that uh, the networking crew is putting in software defined networking. This gives us an opportunity to actually do total on the fly flow control. We could actually use our triggers to say, hey, there's traffic over here that I want to do something special with. Uh, I don't know whether what they've done is actually bad, for sure. So let's actually redirect them in front of this other set of sensors that's really good at figuring that out. But I don't have the budget to build the big sensors so it's moving, so it's watching everything. I can actually have all these different paths in front of different tool sets. Or I can actually use it to redirect completely to a honeypot on the fly, almost transparently. Or if I'm really, really brave, and I have no idea how this would actually work uh, practically, but we're exploring it, is I can take the production system in the VMware, clone it, uh, have some sort of mechanism that actually shuts it off from uh, sensitive data, and let them hack that. And at least I will find out a little bit more about intent. What are they actually after, and how would they get it? Right. Talking about the limits of devices. Um, what do you do when you outgrow your solutions? I'm not entirely sure what this looks like yet because at our scales, there are no better solutions. I mean, the ones that we've put in barely run as they are. When we win an RFP, it's because it's the one that fell down the least. Uh, so when you can't handle all these kinds of things, when you're designing these kinds of networks, uh, thinking about scaling, uh, thinking about upgrades, upgrade paths, and most importantly, think about your exit strategy. So as you're actually putting together that RFP, as you're trying to figure out what the solution looks like, you should already be thinking about what the next solution is going to look like. And that's going to require you to actually talk to management because they're going to have an idea of what that network needs to look like, or at the very least, what the business needs to look like. So now there's a big flow, and basically you're standing in, at the bottom of a hill in front of an avalanche going, stop! <laughs> like I said, I don't exactly know what this looks like yet, uh, but one key piece that seems to be working really well for us is horizontal scaling, so the add another box scaling. That works reasonably well, uh, but it adds a lot more to the overhead to manage all those boxes. So a quick note, uh, chose these guys as the patron saints of this tactical defense because these are two average Joes that have been thrown into uh, well, an intelligent horde of adversaries that are trying everything that they can to take these guys down and they're just trying to survive. Um, the, highest no the highest concentration of compromises from airports and hospitals. Uh, the, uh, the, I'm not entirely certain why. The, the, the only thing that I got to latch onto is it just so happens that one of the uh, people I was in as an undergrad with is now working in one of the hospitals and she had her credentials compromised. Were those people that are researchers working within a hospital? Or people that this was a researcher, yes. This was. Okay, this wasn't somebody visiting a hospital to test Correct. Them. This was not a visitor. Uh, in this particular case, it turned out that somebody had forged our name in a phishing attack to try to convince them to give, to f convince her to give them her journals that they would publish for free if she just logs in over here. Uh, that's that's one anecdote that I can share. I don't know enough, but I know that like, I, I can almost guarantee that it'll be everything, like. Everything that you can think of in every way that is compromised, it's probably been used. I mean, we just got enough of a population that we're statistically significant.
Let me repeat what was at the bottom of that slide. Every make, every model, every vintage. <laughs> well, there's a gentleman in the second row here who's our architect, who's architecting our replacement for log management uh, that is supposed to scale out across the next 10 years to 4 million events a second. So we log. We log everything. And that's just 90 days. <laughs> yes, sir. How many protocols did you introduce to like, did you mention RDP, SSH? How many protocols did you kick, uh, kick down? Oh, at the tactical side, we don't have a strategy because we're just, we're just reacting. So loudest first. So it just so happens that on our, our network, RDP and SSH were neck and neck. As Well, actually, that's not entirely true. Telnet was number one. Uh, and after a quick dig through on that funny story there, uh, we could not find a single valid use of inbound telnet. We did find six, comp no, nine compromised switches. Uh, <laughs> so that's now blocked. Uh, sorry, you were first. I think evil thoughts, he does the math. <laughs> yes? Quick question, really quick. You said you redirect the same files. Have you ever had anything evade your redirect? Just pick that up. Not that I've noticed. I've had people go away, so maybe they've detected it. I've had uh, uh, um, Chaos Computer Club log into one of my honeypots, do two quick LSs and disappear. <laughs> uh, sorry, there's one from you. <laughs> Thanks. Sir. Uh, most of it's actually custom tools using uh, the various APIs available from the vendors. So the Oh, sorry. Uh, how do we actually manage the configuration on the vendor's devices? Yes, I'm repeating. Uh, so the... <laughs> uh, we have a, a, a stack of custom uh, scripts that actually communicate through whatever API they give us. Uh, not at this time, but that's coming up. Oh, this is for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I mean, we, we've seen. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? And one of the slides it says that when an attack is coming from an IP address, yeah. like a collection of IP address, same same IP addresses, then you block them, right? But let's say an attacker uses a proxy and he keeps changing the IP address and then performs the attack. So how would you? Just to repeat the question. So the question is, um, if we are aggregating IP addresses into subnets or whatever, um, how, how do we block a single attacker who is bouncing around through different proxies? It's kind of two different scenarios. Um, we've seen like weaponized subnets where all they do is attack all day long. Um, those are the ones we roll those up and aggregate those. Um, uh, whereas a single attacker bouncing around through different proxies, it's a bit it's a bit tr trickier to, to nail them. But um, aggressive log monitoring, fingerprinting, tool signatures, etc. So we can see their attacks. Um, tying it all back to, to know it's the same attacker that's an attribution problem. And that's that's a little bit tricky. But we can see we can see all the different places that they're attacking from. We just not, might not necessarily be able to identify that it's the same user. So you would need to continuously monitor them, right? Yes. Yeah, continuously monitoring, um, not not manually. I mean, continuously monitoring via automated tools, um, and then we monitor the tools manually. But does that answer it more or less? Okay. In, in 
in the, in the lifecycle loop, as you're doing that monitoring, you might find yourself with a signature set that you can actually use depending on what they're using. If they're using a particular tool, then you use that to block them out. Yes, it might be one attacker, it might be more than one. Again, if it's a single proxy have with multiple attackers behind it uh, is also possible in our network. So, you know, actually aggregating at behind proxies doesn't really matter to us if we've got other techniques for blocking them. Make sense? Have we used machine learning to flip the script to what is good and loosen rules as it comes in? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, not directly. Um, mostly because I'm a curmudgeon and I can't yeah. actually see good traffic. No, not at this time. Uh, part of the uh, threat intelligence stuff is leading towards that, though, yes. <laughs> Take it to the beer. Anything else? You got one there? Yeah, so Last one, sorry. You mentioned you mentioned Angular and PHP. Uh, uh, one of the things that I'm noticing about Angular, and this this is Rob's like for the bigger question that I want to ask, is that uh, most of the exploits that are using are already hacked and they're attacking people who haven't uh, they're not up to the latest updated patch level and they're using software slash IE or whatever. Do you notify users when you detect traffic indicating that software do we notify users when software is not up to date and is under attack by known tools? We inform owners of assets when those owners are U of T assets. Okay. Beyond, yeah. Of, okay, All right. And now you get to give away a $50 gift certificate for no starch for an ebook um, for the best question. Actually, it's not going to be for the best question. It's going to be this gentleman right here because he's sitting here taking copious amounts of notes. <laughs> there you go. And maybe next year you could be up here with your presentation, right? There you go. Thank you. Cheers. All right, um, Peter and Mark, our next speakers, if you could make your way up here and start getting set up. And while that is going on, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Is Craig Barreto, and I hope I'm getting your name correct, is Craig in the house? Craig, aha, there you are. Ben is looking for you. Ben's over here. All right, you stand there, he'll come to you. There's service. Oh, he's going to talk. All right, how many CISSPs do we have in the house? Shame on all of you. Um, <laughs> no, no, hands back up, hands back up. Craig, Craig is trying to reboot the local ISC Square chapter, um, so he's looking for people, so go talk to him. Craig, Craig, right over there, okay? He needs help, he needs money, he needs venues, make yourself useful, and people. A date, too, if you're free, bye. And I'm still on the board of directors for two months more, so I'm going to just emphasize, go talk to him. You'll vote me in out of spite. Now, that would be hilarious. <laughs> Bastard. All right, a few things here. I'd like to say thank you to uh, our sponsors without, the, without whose support this would not have been possible. Uh, I know we're gonna, we said it before, but I'll say it again. We, I'd like to say thank you to Scalar, eCentire, who is hiring, so go find them. Uh, Elastica, Fortinet, Vectra, who is giving away a drone. So if you get your business card into the Stein up at the front desk, you have a chance to win that. And to Akamai, my day job, who provided uh, the full suite of services for our website. Uh, what else we got going on here? Do, 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 do. If anybody is short a seat, be sure to find one uh, while we're getting set up here. 
And then we did Craig, we got the beer. And right after this talk, we will have lunch served. So stick around.